Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to answer the question, can stocks or stock markets or stock indices go down for 30 years? If you're interested in learning how the stock market really works or just want to see what I'm trading these days or investing in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So anyone who's been following the markets for a while knows that the way one way markets behave is that you have trending periods and then you have sideways periods. And often in these sideways periods, you will have crashes. We had a big uptrend, multi, multi, uh, really multi-decade uptrend from 1982 until the peak in uh, 2000 in the US. This is a chart of the S&P 500. So we had this very strong trend for, for really 18 years. And then we had a lost decade in the early 2000s, from really 2000 until 2013, where we had too many stock market crashes, or actually they weren't many, they were quite quite severe. Both of them were about 50%. We had sort of the dot-com crash, and then we had the great financial crisis. And as a result of this, stocks really went nowhere for 10 years, and they spent a lot of time sort of working off the high PEs that they had acquired in the late 90s and early in 2000. And then after this period of consolidation, the sideways movement, we had a very strong trend for the last 10 years. We started to hit new highs in 2013, uh, and then we just really went straight up. Uh, with very few corrections. Now, 2020, the new decade, is looking a little bit more bleak, very high volatility, and it looks to me like we may be entering a sideways period. So I wanted to look at some historical precedents to see if we can understand better what's happening. But this is the first thing to understand, that we have strong trending periods and we have sideways periods. If you're in one of these sideways periods, you better be getting a good dividend yield while you wait. Right now, the dividend yield is, is quite low on the S&P uh, S&P 500. Uh, but when stocks are going nowhere, especially if you're an indexer, a passive investor where you're buying the index uh, over time, if it goes sideways, you don't make any money. Now, I'm going to look at a couple of historical stock markets to try to answer this question about how stocks can behave over very long periods of time. There's a great tweet from Raul Paul who talks about how the UK market, the UK stock market, which obviously wasn't as developed as it as it is today, but traded sideways from 1750 to 1950, a 200 year sideways consolidation period. I wasn't I was unable to find a chart of this, but obviously there were some big drawdowns during, uh, in this as well, uh, probably during the uh, American Revolution. That wasn't necessarily good for England. Also, uh, World War One, World War Two. Uh, so this is a 200-year sideways market. We could almost call it a bear market. And it looks to me like it started shortly after the South Sea bubble, uh, which was this famous uh, bubble in a British joint stock company uh, that popped in 1720 and really initiated a 200-year sideways market. Now, there are other, other precedents like this, obviously. German stock market, this is a chart of the German stock market from 1930 to 1950. And you can see that you really went nowhere for it was lower uh, uh, 20 years later. Obviously, uh, the whole country had been destroyed and bombed to the ground. Um, and it uh, looks like the stock market obviously closed for many years. And when it reopened, it was much lower levels. This is from Barton Biggs' uh, uh, book, Wealth, War, and Wisdom. Two more examples from the 20th century would be uh, the Russian stock, stock market this looks like a, an old Zero Hedge article that was um, was put on this site. But he has two great charts. The uh, This is the Russian stock market uh, going into uh, 1918 and the uh, and the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, what what happened is the, the markets briefly were closed during World War I. They were opened uh, briefly. And then the uh, all, obviously all the industries, all the private wealth was nationalized by, by the Bolsheviks and the stock market essentially went to zero. Now these are extreme examples. This is not, this is not the US. We're, we're sort of drifting towards socialism. I'm not expecting a Bolshevik revolution anytime, anytime soon. So let's look at some less extreme examples. But I just wanted to point out these examples. I believe the Argentinian stock market has gone to zero a few times, maybe Brazil as well. So stock markets, they can go to zero. And if you've been cost averaging into them, this is obviously not a good thing. Uh, we have the precedent of the Dow Jones Industrials after the uh, the great, uh, the 1929, the 1920s uh, bubble, the 1929 crash and the Great Depression. We can see here that stocks really went nowhere from 
the peaks in 1929 all the way to call it 1955 or so. So not quite 30 years. Uh, the one difference here is that uh, dividend yields were much higher. And so this wasn't quite as bad as it looked, uh, especially if you were if you were cost averaging in. But this is still uh, really almost a uh, uh, call it a 25 year uh, lost uh, lost period in time. So that would be the Great Depression. There were a lot of policy mistakes made then. Uh, so let's look at some more recent examples. The really famous one is the Nikkei, the Japanese um, the Nikkei 225 index. This is the Japanese stock market. Currently trading at about 19,619. Uh, you can see that the, the Nikkei is back to levels that it first hit in the late 1980s, call it 1987. Now, this is back when uh, it hit those levels when there was a uh, stock market and real estate bubble in Japan. You can see that it accelerated in the late 80s and uh, peaked, I want to say, it peaked in uh, 89. Uh, but the stocks have basically gone nowhere in Japan for all of these years. Now this is interesting especially because Japan was the first market uh, that I know about that did uh, that cut interest rates really sharply. They cut interest rates close to zero. Uh, at some point interest rates even went negative and they had to start doing quantitative easing. Quanti they started doing quantitative easing in uh, call it 2000, uh, 2001. So we're slightly higher in the, in the Japanese, in the Nikkei, uh, than we were in 2001 when quantitative easing started, uh, but we're still very, very far below the peaks, and uh, we're also uh, really at break even. If you started investing in the late 80s, you would still uh, be sort of break even. I don't think these Japanese companies ever paid much of a dividend yield either. Uh, you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. If someone knows about that, but here is really a 30 year. Uh, more than 30 year dead market. Now this is surprising considering they're printing money, buying bonds, and eventually they were actually buying ETFs. They were buying the stock market as a whole, and yet it didn't do anything. Uh, I have a graphic here of uh, quantitative easing for those who haven't been following my video. Basically is when a central bank prints money, uses it to buy assets. And this is obviously very bad for the currency to be buying more. But Japan's a really weird, weird case because they were doing quantitative easing and they still have never been able to get their stock market uh, back up to where it was. So this is this is a modern example of an economy that really entered into deflation and uh, you might say a liquidity trap and never escaped. So this is one possibility for the US going forward. Now, the one difference is Japan did not hold the world reserve currency. The U.S. does. So we may be able to print our way uh, out, of, out of our problems, which will, of course, devalue the currency. Uh, but just, just uh, this is such an interesting chart of the Nikkei because Japan, obviously a uh, very modern country, amazing uh, technology companies. Uh, they're really um, an impress impressive country. Uh, all of, and yet their stock market really trapped in these doldrums for decades and decades and decades. That's, uh, that's Japan. Let's take a look at China. Uh, here's the Shanghai Composite Index. Currently at 2860, we are back to uh, levels that were first crossed in early 2007. So it's really been a 13-year uh, a sideways market there with two, uh, two bubbles, two bubbles where it looks like you, you were sort of escaping from uh, the gravity of lower stock prices, and yet everything mean reverted. Uh, I also, also wanted to look at the Hang Seng, uh, the Hong Kong stock market, uh, also back to uh, 2007 levels. Now let's turn to Europe. Uh, the CAC 40, obviously uh, France, uh, we are back to uh, call it 1999 levels on the CAC 40. This was before uh, this is right before the euro was uh, was uh, introduced and standardized. I believe it was uh, I want to say 1999. Uh, and so the, the 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 French stock market has really gone nowhere for uh, 20 years. The IBEX 35, the Spanish stock market, back to uh, 1997 levels, gone nowhere, nowhere for uh, 20 23 years. German stock market has done better. You can see that we're way, well above 
uh, well above 90s levels. And uh, we're actually not too far from all time highs. It looks a little bit, a little bit like the S&P 500. Now I wanted to do an experiment because obviously you can't talk about different stock markets and compare them if they are in different currencies. This is the weird thing. So I thought I would standardize all these stock markets by looking at them in gold terms. Gold is sort of a universal currency. You, uh, it's accepted in, in countries all around the world. It's been around for uh, thousands of years, if not ten th tens of thousands of years. So I thought I'd standardize these charts by looking at them in gold terms. And I was actually surprised by the results. Things look much worse than you would expect simply because gold is a store of value uh, and we have all these economies that have been printing money, doing quantitative easing like Japan. So here's a chart of the Nikkei 225 in gold terms. Uh, peaked around, uh, call it around 100, now trading at 11. So down almost 90% in gold terms since 1989. And so what this tells you is that you would have been much better holding gold over the last uh, 30 years in, uh, in Japan rather than holding a basket of their biggest, most successful companies, which is surprising because Japan obviously has great, uh, great companies. Here's the uh, Shanghai Composite in gold, uh, really gone nowhere since its introduction. If you look at it in gold terms, and there may this may there may be some uh, geopolitical reason behind this, where they're sort of uh, uh, the Chinese or government is playing around with the currency and trying to keep uh, the stock market standard in gold terms. It's just striking that we're all the way, all the way back here. That's the Shanghai. Uh, the CAC 40 peaked around 26. Uh, you can see a lot of these peaks were in the year 2000. It was a very significant year when the NASDAQ peaked for the first time, and the S&P peaked. And in many ways, world stock markets are way down since that peak, and that peak measured in gold terms. That's really when 99, uh, early 2000 was when the uh, the world central banks, I remember the Bank of England dumping all their gold then or dumping a lot of their gold. Uh, and But you can see that they were selling at the exact wrong time. Gold has definitely outperformed stocks as, as demonstrated by this chart of the CAC 40 expressed in gold terms. Uh, this is the uh, IMOEX uh, expressed in gold terms. I'm sorry, I'm totally blanking on what this is. Uh, let's see, IMOEX. Oh, this is the Russian uh, stock market. Uh, so that has really back to early 2000 uh, levels in gold terms. And if we look at the DAX in gold terms, we see this, this same pattern where we got a peak in uh, late 90s, early 2000, and the stock market has been down very, very sharply in gold terms. Finally, the S&P in gold terms. Uh, Obviously, the S&P has hit new nominal highs expressed in dollar terms uh, as early as uh, January and February of this, of this year, of 2020. But if you look at it in terms of its purchasing power, so obviously the reason we hold stocks is because at some point we would like to sell those stocks and use, use the money to buy things or pass it on to our children or grandchildren so maybe they can put themselves through college or, or buy things with it. And so you, you want, you, if you're investing in stocks, you want your wealth to grow or at least be a stable store of value. But this shows that the S&P 500 in gold terms, in spite of all the innovation we've had, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, uh, the Amazons of the world, uh, obviously the world is a much different place. It's a much more uh, comfortable and advanced place with smartphones and um, amazing technology and medical technology. But in stock market terms and in gold terms, we're really back to the late 90s in the S&P 500. So there's been a much inferior form of uh, storing your wealth and growing your wealth than gold. And this um, is quite shocking and again, interesting to see that the peak happened around uh, around 2000. So that's the S&P 500. Uh, the Dow looks very similar back to uh, 1996 terms. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, or the Dow 30 expressed in gold terms. And then finally, I thought I'd end with a, a chart of gold itself, which is doing this amazing sort of cup formation here, maybe a cup and handle. Uh, you can see that actually gold has been outperforming everything, outperforming stocks. Uh, it too had a very long a sideways movement after this sort of hyperinflationary 70s. Uh, gold uh, went nowhere 
for uh, two decades. And then uh, as we've had uh, lower and lower interest rates in the U.S., as we've had quantitative easing, it has done quite well, especially when you compare it, uh, compare it to stocks. Gold is something I expect to do better than stocks in the uh, 2000, uh, 2020s. Finally, wanted to end with a, uh, we had that previous chart uh, where we looked at uh, what the, the, the uh, Russian stock market did after the Bolshevik Revolution going to zero as all the industries were nationalized. So that's the, the Russian stock market or Russian asset market. Uh, I'm not sure how developed the actual stock market was. Here's the price of gold during the hyperinflation that occurred both during the, the Russian Civil War and uh, the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. Uh, the currency obviously ended up uh, losing all its value after the, the Bolshevik Revolution, and gold did very, very well, going from 100 uh, to over, um, I guess this is indexed to gold at 100 and 1900, uh, going over 10,000 uh, after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution and in the early 1920s. Now, this is why you have to be very careful listening to experts, people like Warren Buffett, who says that investing is gold, investing in gold is stupid. Obviously, it's a uh, competitive asset class for him. Uh, but when you look at these charts and you look at the way stock markets have performed in, in gold terms, uh, it's hard to understand why Buffett, Buffett would have an opinion uh, like this, especially since he's underperformed the stock market. Uh, for many, many years. So in the 2020s, I think there will be some interesting stocks that stand out, but the indices as a whole, uh, I think it's quite likely that we enter this sideways period. And as we saw with Japan, even with quantitative easing, uh, it's no guarantee that you can get your stock market higher. Now, it may turn out to be different because the US dollar is the world reserve currency that gives us certain superpowers. Uh, for example, we can uh, just print print new dollars out of nowhere, and we can use them to buy oil. Every other country actually has to uh, extract oil from the ground or trade it for something useful, but we can actually just print money out of nowhere, buy really cool things with it. Unfortunately, this does devalue the dollar, and it means that gold and things that are like gold, scarce assets like uh, coastal real estate, uh, Picassos and Van Goghs, rare cars, rare baseball cards, uh, and gold, anything that the Fed cannot print uh, should do really well. And in this category, uh, I would include Bitcoin as well. Bitcoin is just is, is even more scarce than gold. There are only 21 million coins. And so um, very interesting gold stocks, the GDX index, physical gold and Bitcoin for the 2020s. Hope you guys found this uh, video helpful. If you did, please hit that subscribe and like button and let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below as well as any ideas you have for what I should make my next video about. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.